Good morning, I guess kind of good late morning to everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Tracy Lesky, um, the Director and Research Leader of the USDA um, ARS Appalachian Fruit Research Station in Kearneysville, West Virginia, which saying that out loud, I need to get down there for a visit. It's a beautiful area. Um, Tracy is a Western PA native and uh, she's worked on various groups of insects throughout her research career. Um, I was really interested to see the, the diversity of some of the stuff she's done. So I'll just mention briefly, she started early um, doing some research with um, on up malpigian tubules and crane flies as an undergrad. And then she looked at the impacts of maple flowering on thrips reproduction as a master student, and then olfactory and visual stimuli that are important for plum curculio um, host finding as a PhD student and plum curculio is a weevil. Um, so, or a snout beetle. So, of course, it was the weevil that brought us together. Um, uh, when I was at my former institution, started doing some work there with um, a weevil, which are really cute but challenging insects to work with. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, Tracy join our weevil symposium at the ESA meeting when it was back in, when it was in Vancouver, Canada, which was really mm -hmm. nice. So um, now uh, Tracy's focused on several invasive insects that pose threats to our tree fruit industry. Um, and I'm excited to learn more about the status of uh, brown marmorated sting bug management from her and all the work her team's been doing. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for the invitation. So, and, and it's great to be with all of you today, even virtually. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about the story of the brown marmorated sting bug and our work toward developing sustainable management tactics for this invasive species in a vulnerable cropping system, which in this case is tree fruit. Um, and I'm going to ask Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are my slides changing? Just let me yes. know. Everything okay. looks great. Thank okay, you. I just want to make sure. Okay, so brown marmorated stink bug or BMSB is an invasive species it's, that has invaded North America, Europe, and South America. It's native to China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And this species is classified as invasive because of the ecological and economic harm it had the potential to inflict. In terms of its life history, um, a typical stink bug species, there are five nymph instars and um, the life cycle just briefly the adults overwinter in human-made structures as well as natural host habitat in the spring there is a protracted emergence period where adults leave these overwintering sites they begin feeding and reproducing feeding on fruiting crops as they mature um, there are typically one to two generations per year and in the late summer, early fall, the adults again seek out overwintering sites. Now for us, um, this insect has been in our region for a number of years. It was originally identified in Allentown, Pennsylvania um, with the first official record occurring in 2001. In our region, we found the first official specimens in West Virginia and Maryland in 2003 and 2004. But the question is, how do you go from just one or two specimens to what we experienced in 2010, which was a spectacular outbreak of brown marmorated stink bug throughout the mid-Atlantic region? Really, it comes down to most likely what we refer to as the enemy release hypothesis. When an organism is introduced into an exotic region, it experiences a decrease in regulation by natural enemies that, he, that it evolved with, and it, this results in a rapid increase in distribution and abundance. And certainly we started to see that with BMSB as early as 2008. During 2008 season, this was the first time we were really seeing significant late season problems in tree fruit, where we had large numbers of insects invading orchards and feeding on the fruit. And even at that point, some growers were estimating they were losing about 10% of their crop from this invasive bug. Now things changed really dramatically in 2010, because this was the first time we ever observed widespread early season orchard activity where the adults were leaving over wintering sites and feeding on developing fruit. We assumed that some of the cover sprays that were going on um, for uh, other key insects in our tree fruit systems would manage BMSB like it does for our native stink bugs, but I can tell you we were quite wrong. Um, we were starting to see uh, by about mid-season some very severe injury in our stone fruit, and this is a peach about midway through the growing season. And you can see that necrotic flesh, 
deep beneath the skin. And so this was from that early season feeding. So at that point we hit harvest and our growers were really just devastated. Many mid-Atlantic growers really just experienced catastrophic levels of injury with them losing over 50% of their crop. In this case, growers were literally stripping the fruit from the trees and allowing it to rot on the ground. Um, similarly, we had damage in other fruiting crops, fruiting vegetables, row crops. This bug was feeding just about on anything you can think of. And so for our tree fruit growers and particularly apple, which is um, a major crop in our region, there were about $37 million in losses uh, from BMSB feeding. And this is the corky flesh you see. This is a pink lady apple about eight weeks from harvest and it was just devastated by this bug. So at that point we had a crisis and certainly the media enjoyed covering the crisis in some ways. I mean, they did a very good job talking about the, um, the crop problems being inflicted by this pest, but they also really did a good job covering the other side of the story, which is the nuisance pest problems. And this was on the front page of um, the New York Times in September of 2010. This is a farm not far from our location. And you can see the title, move over bed bugs, stink bugs have landed. And they're literally just scooping up piles of brown marmorated stink bugs. And so this is an email that uh, a homeowner um, sent me um, because he did not like the definition of nuisance pest. He felt like they were having a much greater impact on his life. And so this is what he sent to me. This weekend, I vacuumed up more than 8,000 stink bugs. The vast majority were alive in my attic to add to the more than 4,000 I've removed from my living space since January 1st, 2011. I have now destroyed 12,348 stink bugs in my home in 45 days since January 1st, 2011. And, uh, he uh, actually is a, was a scientist. He's retired now with uh, uh, the National Wildlife Federation. And he actually joined our group as kind of the resident expert in terms of nuisance problems. And that kind of helped him come to terms with the problems he was having in his home. But at that time, um, certainly the legislature, uh, our Congress was very interested in where BMSB was and the kind of problems it was inflicting. And so back in 2011, I was doing a lot of congressional briefings. And this was a simple map I put together to try to depict the issues and the intensity of the issues in different states. Um, as you can see, you know, the problems were really limited to the mid-Atlantic. But let's jump a decade later, you can see that this pest has spread and been detected around the country with many more states, um, you know, reporting both ag and nuisance pest problems. And this bug is also spread around the globe with invasions in parts of Europe. This is the native range, of course, um, as well as uh, Chile in South America. And so if you see these sort of red circles that I've drawn, it, you can kind of see that if you draw a line across the globe, it's sort of interesting that that's where the most intensive problems from this pest have occurred. But back in 2010, we really had to deal with a crisis. And the question is, how do you do that? And really, it comes down to, as we've done for other major entomological problems, build a collaborative team. And so we developed and, and launched an IPM BMSB working group back in 2010. And so this was a very inclusive group that included growers, researchers, extension personnel, regulatory officials, state departments of ag, students. And we came together and really started to discuss what did we need to do first? What were our priorities? And initially we all recognized that we were dealing with a landscape level threat. This bug could not only be feeding and reproducing in your apple orchard, but also on the neighboring cornfield, as well as invasive plants like Tree of Heaven and even native woody hosts. So from the, these meetings initially, this was the set of priorities that were generated. And I'm going to talk about those today in terms of my research and the programs that uh, my folks have worked on. Studies of the biology, ecology, and behavior of this invasive species because we knew very little, identification of an aggregation pheromone and standardized sampling and monitoring techniques, identification of effective insecticides because we didn't even know how to kill it at the beginning, and long-term solutions like biological control. So these are the key questions that I'll cover in my talk today um, from kind of those short-term goals that we needed to 
um, sort of achieve right away versus the long term where we are now. Um, they include what insecticides can we use to manage BMSB? What are the some of the biological and behavioral characteristics that contribute to its pest status? How can we monitor BMSB and make good management decisions? What other, other IPM tactics can we use and how can we integrate biological control for the long term? So to begin with, back in 2010, there was a lot of challenges in managing this pest because there were no management recommendations in any cropping system and insecticides labeled as excellent against native stink bugs were not showing the same efficacy against BMSB. We were seeing literally knockdown and recovery where large numbers of seemingly dead bugs um, following a spray would recover and start climbing back up into the trees. And so immediately our laboratory, along with my colleagues at Penn State and Virginia Tech, we did a number of complementary trials to make some initial recommendations for materials that growers could spray. And this was followed by confirmation in the field. But for us at the lab, what we wanted to do was target the adult stage because that reduces all subsequent life stages. And because of their dispersive behavior, we knew growers were going to have to rely on the presence of active dry residue because this bug is constantly moving and invading from the border. So we developed this kind of three-part bioassay where we exposed insects to dry residues, 18 hour old dry residue at label rates for tree fruit in these ethovision um, uh, arenas. And following that, and this would allow us to measure their horizontal mobility, following that exposure, we would do direct observations of vertical mobility to look at knockdown and recovery for about 15 minutes. And then we track mortality for seven days to ensure that dead was truly dead or potentially would they recover. And so this is just our setup and you can see the bugs in the arenas and the way our, our system works is we are able to capture images six times per second in the X, Y axes. And so this then produces these tracks that allows you to look at how they uh, responded. And so at the top, you can see water at zero, one and two hours and at the bottom warrior up pyrethroid. And what you can see with warrior is that the insect was immediately stimulated it appeared to become quite intoxicated and succumb and potentially die. But in fact, these insects in this trial did not die and many of them reproduced. So hence the seven day um, survivorship. And what we did was to look at the data in terms of a ranking system where we would rank them as either alive, which is in red, moribund or dead. And so insects that were alive had increasing mortality over time, as you see with permethrin. So that would be considered a promising material from the standpoint of being able to kill BMSB versus a sale, um, which what we saw in over time was um, a lot of knockdown and recovery occurring. And so we took all of this information and we created what's referred to as a lethality index. Um, and others have used this and added on to this concept since we first published it. But basically, if everybody died in a trial on the first day, the maximum value that this um, equation would generate would be 100. Whereas if nobody died and everybody was fine through the trial, the minimum value would be zero. And so we use this to try to rank compounds so we could make decisions as to management. And these are the materials after um, all of this that we um, really settled on and what growers have used over the years to manage BMSB. Um, they all had high to moderate lethality indexes, but in, or indices, I should say, but they also had incredibly short residual activity, three days or less. And, you know, based on WSU's ranking system for um, their impacts on natural enemies, you can see these were not particularly friendly, as we know. So, we needed to get beyond just putting out the fire for BMSB and really move toward more integrated practices that we could reduce insecticide applications. But to do this, we really needed to understand more about the biological and behavioral characteristics of this insect that contribute to its pest status. And so I'll talk about a few of these today. One is, what is the dispersal capacity of BMSB adults and nymphs? And so this took us into a lot of different kinds of work. And I'm just gonna show you the kinds of examples of the research that we conducted 
um, to really get at this question. So for adults, for example, and hopefully I'll be able to play this, um, we use flight mills to just look at baseline dispersal capacity. We also used ethovision to measure horizontal mobility for both adults and nymphs. We did direct observations of nymphal movement um, in different environments and terrains. And we used our harmonic radar system where you tag insects and uh, track their movements in the environment. And so all of these studies that we, um, we conducted enabled us to really uh, learn just how dispersive they really were. And so for adults, for example, on average, they can fly greater than two kilometers per day. And in some cases we had individuals that would fly as much as 150 kilometers per day. The nymphs would uh, walk easily 25 meters per day. And so what this meant was that not only could these insects be moving in and between and among crops, but it's particularly the, the adults, they could be moving among farms. And so we now know that we have a pretty dispersive insect that is, um, constantly moving in. So that was something to keep in mind. We also had a suspicion that we had a fairly large population overwintering in the natural landscape, but we had no information about it. And so um, we know that when the bugs start seeking overwintering sites, they're very conspicuous on arrival, they'll cover surfaces, but once they seek out these tight, dry sites, they really aggregate and they're quite concealed. And one of the things we observed in our orchard settings was that we were seeing a lot of apparent dispersal from wild host habitat and not from areas that were associated with human based structures. So we wanted to get at this question and we decided to become human surveyors searching in likely overwintering locations in natural areas for BMSB. So under the bark, in leaf litter, under rocks and logs, anywhere where insects would typically overwinter. And what we found was two areas where we found them overwintering. In this case, they were always uh, dead trees, but in very dry areas, just beneath the bark or deep in the wood itself, as you can see here. But I can tell you that we were also not very efficient surveyors. So here is a little dot. That is how much surveying we were able to complete over three winter seasons with BMSB. And we wanted to see if we could first of all, confirm what we did, but poss possibly try to see if we could do it faster. So enter the National Detector Dog Training Center in Noonan, Georgia, where they train detector dogs that you meet in airports or in ports and things like that. This is Jody and Jenny and the dog Tig and Opal. And so we worked with them to try to determine if we could train them to seek out and, and identify overwintering stink bugs. And so their work began in Noonan, Georgia, where we would send them overwintering bugs and they would um, seek them out in, in these just cardboard boxes. Now, when the dog finds a target, he'll sit down next to the box and he'll, and Jody will say, show me, and he'll kind of hit it with his nose. And if he's right, he gets a cookie. And so that's how we started with this. And so Tig is sniffing the boxes and you'll see if he thinks that he's found a target, he's gonna sit down next to the box and um, show that he's found the target. And if he's correct, he gets a cookie. And so he was a very happy dog and he got a cookie. So eventually as we moved on and increased sort of the complexity in natural environments, we were able to get the dogs out to our location. And what we were able to find is that the canine surveyors confirmed all of our results, but they were 20 times faster. And so, this is a, a, a potential solution toward trying to find highly concealed invasive species and also getting a sense of possible relative densities in, in, in these areas. So from this work, we really determined that um, the factors that were contributing to its pest status included the fact that it's highly dispersive, it can disperse among crops within a farm or across the landscape, and the adults are concealed from intervention for over half the year, leading to potentially unchecked populations to invade. And so you put that together with a highly prolificous pest, which BMSB is, it feeds on over 170 hosts. We need to really have sensitive monitoring tools to determine when this bug is going to invade. And so this gets into the next section that I'll talk about, which is how can we monitor BMSB? 
Um, so in this case, what we wanted to do, and this is something my lab has always focused on, developing monitoring and management systems for pests using their behavior, we wanted to use tools that could provide accurate measure, measurements of presence, relative abundance, and seasonal activity. So our growers could make um, informed management decisions. But the other thing that became very important, and we were funded by places like New Zealand, they wanted a biosurveillance system that they could use to detect, exclude, and eradicate BMSB should it invade um, their uh, systems. So, but for our growers, it was an acute problem. So this is a spray schedule from one of my growers in 2011. This is just their BMSB spray schedule. They have a highly diversified farm and essentially they're on a calendar spray program, often spraying their crops at least twice a week. We had literally had growers putting on 20 applications in the early days trying to manage this pest. So de developing a trapping system was critical. And so these are the four key components that we kind of put together when we're developing a trapping system and a monitoring tool. These include potentially identifying visual cues that can be incorporated into the trap design. And in this case, a black pyramid trap for BMSB serves as a tree mimic, a trunk, sort of a trunk. And so this became sort of the base then um, olfactory cues. And I'll talk about the identification of the pheromone and pheromone synergist, which now is a standard in uh, lures for BMSB, a capture mechanism that can be used to retain the insect. And in this case, we had to use a killing agent, um, a kill strip to retain the bugs captured in the jar top. Otherwise they walk back out. And then a deployment strategy. Where should you deploy these to really accurately monitor that presence, relative abundance, and seasonal activity? And what we found was that at the border or the interior can work. But let's jump back to the olfactory cues and talk about that. Um, back in 2010, 2011, there was only one attractant available for BMSB, and that was methyl decatrienoate. It's a pheromone produced by another Asian stink bug species, Plotius dolli, but it is cross-attractive to BMSB and other pentatomids. And so this was available, but it also had some serious limitations. And the serious limitations were, interestingly, that the adults did not become or were not attracted to the stimulus until late in the season. So this is some data from some monitoring traps in a peach orchard. And you can see the phenology here at the top and the data at the bottom. This is the period where we saw lots of bugs invading this orchard. We were counting, you know, 20, 30, 40 per tree, nothing in our trap. So this is a problem. Interestingly, nymphs are actually attracted to the season long, but adults, not till the late season. So led by my colleague, Ashot Crimian, we had a group within USDA ARS um, that has worked on identification and commercialization of the BMSB aggregation pheromone. And based on volatile collections and a stereoisomeric library that Ashot was able to create, we eventually had a breakthrough in September of 2011 where this was a compound we referred to as number 10 because it was just the 10th treatment we had tested, where we saw large numbers of bugs flying into traps and aggregating around traps and it looked really attractive. And so we thought, wow, maybe we, we have found the pheromone, but it was late in the season. So we were a little nervous that, hey, is this just another late season attractant? So the next spring, we were able to get out pretty early and um, we put out traps baited with the BMSB pheromone versus unbaited controls. And what we were able to find right out of the gate was that we did see significant attraction to this number 10 compound. And so we were pretty sure at that point we had identified the pheromone, which I abbreviate throughout this section as fair. But we needed to validate that this was the pheromone. And with our colleagues that we have been through um, two SCRI grants and what I refer to as our Stop BMSB project, we put this trial out. And there were a number of questions. In particular, is BMSB attracted to the pheromone in the early season? Is BMSB attracted to the pheromone season long? And how attractive is this pheromone relative to methyl decotrienoate and unbaited traps? So in this initial trial, we went out with BMSB pheromone based on a synthesis that Ashot had done, and the lures were formulated with 10 milligrams of material. Methyl decotrienoate, this was a commercial 
um, lure and it had 119 milligrams. So a 10 X greater loading and an unbated control. And this was done in 12 states across the country season long. And so what we were able to show, and this is early, mid and late season, is that both adults and nymphs were attracted to this season long. Um, and so you can see the pheromone for adults uh, being very attractive, but you can also see interestingly when this MDT response starts to kick in and here we have kind of a dose response going on with the nymphs, um, the pheromone was also attractive, but again, they're attracted to MDT season long. So you can see that dose response right away. Um, so that was good. But the next logical step is, of course, what happens if you put them together? So this is the uh, two component aggregation pheromone, the SR SSRS and RSRS isomers, and the methyl weight. And led by my colleague, at, um, Don Weber, we were able to show that by combining these, you get a really synergistic effect. And so in other words, two plus two no longer equals four. It's not an additive effect. You get kind of two plus two equals eight, which was really great. But we, again, we wanted to verify this. So we went back to our Stop BMSB team. And in this case, just to see if we could see this uh, synergistic effect season long and asking how attractive was this relative the, to the pheromone alone. So we put the pheromone out again with 10 milligram lures. And in two other treatments, we combined this with two available MDT lures, one at 119 milligrams and one at 66 and compared this with an unbated control season long. And what we found was synergy season long, which was great. Um, and you can see from the early, mid and late season again, and you can also really see in the late season that dose response, if you add more MDT, you get a bigger response, but you have to have the two compounds together to really silly really attractive response. But it told us at this point, we did have the tools to start developing IPM um, tools, and in particular, trap-based treatment thresholds or decision support tools. So we had a lot of discussion around how to do this. Um, how, do you, how do you develop a trap-based treatment threshold? What's the way to do this? And so there are kind of two schools of thought that you know, I, we, we discussed. One is what I refer to as a retrospective approach, which is correlating season-long trap captures and injury at harvest. This is okay, except that the trap captures aren't guiding any management decisions. The growers are often still doing whatever. And so we took what we refer to as a forward-driven approach where we evaluate an experimental set of thresholds to trigger insecticide applications and evaluate the fruit at harvest. In other words, the traps are actually triggering something to begin with. So this was a trial that we conducted where, with our uh, black pyramid traps, where we tried to identify uh, a trap-based treatment threshold and essentially asking the question, can we use the biological information generated by traps to make management decisions? So the experimental treatments that we had were um, sprays being a lot applied when captures in our traps reached one adult per trap, 10 adults per trap, or 20 adults per trap, and this was cumulative. And we compared this with blocks that were sprayed weekly or never sprayed. And it was the trap at the center and the trap at the edge of the block. Now there were more traps than this. This is just sort of representative, but we, we did this throughout the year. And I mean, it's throughout the growing season. And what we found, not surprisingly, you know, with these trap-based treatment thresholds, the lower th threshold um, generated more sprays versus these higher thresholds, which generated fewer sprays. But the important thing is what did injury look like at harvest? And what we found was at harvest, sprays applied when traps reached 10 adults per threshold, not only reduced the sprays by greater than 40%, but protected the fruit as well as the weekly sprays. So this really became our threshold with this black pyramid and with really which were experimental lures at the time, but it showed we could do it. So from there, we really wanted to head toward commercialization and ask questions, can we improve our trapping system based on what is the most sensitive and cost-effective trap design and lure formulation? Can we reliably, reliably detect low adult and nymphal populations with them? And also, what is the size of the area sampled by the most effective trap? 
So this led to a lot of work with a lot of commercial companies and trap designs. And so we had, uh, you know, just a tremendous amount of studies over the years by my postdocs, Rob Morrison and Kevin Rice and others. And eventually we settled on these two trap designs, uh, our standard black pyramid trap and this clear sticky panel deployed atop a wooden post. They're similar and they're both ground in that they're both ground deployed, which reduces the number of decisions a brown marmorated stink bug can make, um, and they provide an upright visual stimulus. The difference is, of course, is the capture and retention mechanism slash killing agent, where this sticky card is the killing agent and capture mechanism versus the, um, the jar top with the killing agent. Um, we had two companies formulate lures for this study, a 1X, which we were, refer were referring as a monitor um, loading, and a biosurveillance, which, which was a 4X higher. And this was specifically formulated to look at this for New Zealand. And so we measured season-long captures of adults at NIMS at 12 sites in several states in the Mid-Atlantic. And what we found was a couple of things. One was that trace A lures outperformed bag bio, but um, all of the lures captured insects. And if you look at adults and nymphs at these different population densities throughout um, the region, we had high, moderate, and low population pressure. Both trap types detected low population densities, which was good because the clear sticky panel was a new design. And nymphs also could be detected with both trap designs. So we were, we were um, um, encouraged by these results. So we also then asked the question, of course, are there significant correlations between these pyramid traps and sticky card captures? And in this case, I'm just showing the, you the data from the trace A lures at the low or um, monitoring loading rate versus the high loading rate. And in every case, we for the different relative population densities, we did see a significant correlation. And this was work led by Angel Asebis Doria where we had both traps reflecting the same season long pattern. So this was good. And this then launched to an even bigger study with our nationwide Stop BMSB team. In this case, where we did nationwide validation of the response to these two trap designs and pheromonal stimuli season long from May to October in the Southeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lakes, the Pacific Northwest and West. We had 18 states and five regions for a total of 118 sites. And it was the exact same um, um, sort of story where pyramid captures, um, captured more adults and nymphs, significantly more, but again, there were significant correlations um, in, in indicating they reflect the same seasonal phenology. So we feel like both trap designs are effective. We ourselves have really started to transition to the panel trap just because it's easier to deploy and maintain. And so this led to some work then by my former postdoc, um, Danielle Kirkpatrick, who's now with Trace. Um, using the methods developed by Jim Miller at Michigan State and his book, Trapping um, Small Organisms Moving Randomly, and trying to calculate the trapping area of a pheromone beta trap. In this case, we wanted to um, define what was the plume reach, which is basically the distance from a beta trap that elicits a behavioral response from the insect, uh, randomly foraging in the environment, this sort of little blue circle area, the maximum dispersive distance, which is the longest distance from which 95% of the population could reach the trap, the trapping radius, which is the longest distance from which the trap can yield target captures, and that's just basically adding together the plume reach and the maximum dispersive distance. And he's then using the um, formula for the circular area, we can then collect, I mean, calculate trapping area. So, um, the methods for this, this is a big mark release recapture experiment where we used wild populations. We wanted to sort of mimic what was going on in nature. We marked them with fluorescent dust and, and released them from these cages at different distances. So it's a single trap, multiple release method where larger numbers are at these longer distances out from the, um, the beta trap at the center. And so this is just a picture of the field setup where you, we had oak foliage, which is a non-host for BMSB, but something that would give them cover so they could kind of 
ease their way out of these um, cages. And um, you can see the distances as we move away. And this was done pre-dawn to minimize escape responses. So we did several different experiments. We had nymphs that were just released in an open field at 10, 20, and 30 meters. We had adults that were released in an open field at 20, 40, 60, and 100 meters. And then we had adults where we released at the edge of an orchard at 20, 40, and 60 meters. And we did this so that we could look at the impact of having a host plant that could possibly be competing with this pheromone trap. And so I'll just sort of share, you, share with you the basic results from this. But what we found is that for the open field, you can see the recapture um, percent recaptured. Then you can see the plume reach, which is based on these recapture um, numbers. And there are, I'm not going to take you through all the equations in the book, but basically we found that the plume reach was pretty short, about three meters. But based on their maximum dispersive distance, you can see in an open field, it's much longer compared with the orchard. And so this translates into different um, trapping areas. So Despite the fact that plume reach is short, um, we have in an open field, a single trap for adults can sample over nearly a five and a half hectare area. It's smaller for nymphs, about um, 0.64 hectares. The dispersive distance though was the big thing, which was really interesting. Um, with this reduction to a little, about 1.7 hectares, um, due to the maximum dispersive distance, it really does indicate that more traps would be necessary to reliably capture adults when they are in the presence of a cultivated crop. So we think that that's a key piece, and we're still working on this, trying to understand how different host plants may affect this overall trapping area. But we know when host plants are present, there is some competition going on. Based on this work, we know that spacing traps about 50 meters apart or more should also reduce competition, which is also very helpful when you're monitoring orchards. So we really have transitioned to these clear sticky panels. And as I mentioned earlier, they are cheaper and easier to deploy. And we're now, we've been working on a, developing a threshold for these as well. And using these same forward driven methods where we um, looked at experimental treatments including the unsprayed or the weekly spray, in this case, four nymphs, four adults, or one adult per trap, we've been able to show that a threshold of four adults per trap reduces sprays by about 50%, but we're getting damage comparable to that of the weekly sprays. It's not perfect every year, but it's, we're in the, you know, we're, it's, it's probably reasonably sensitive. And this has been done in commercial orchards as well. So um, we're pretty confident that we're pretty close with this. But of course, you know, the question is, can you do more with this? And so we wanted to identify additional IPM tactics and asking the question, can we su successfully manipulate BMSB behavior and develop an attracting kill strategy? So this was work led by my former postdoc, Rob Morrison, where first we really wanted to identify, does this insect kind of fit the behavioral basis for attracted to kill. And what we found was, first of all, there is a strong dose response from this insect. In this case, if we increase the amount of pheromone in combination with the synergist, we were able to show you can capture over, well, in this case, kill over 55,000 BMSB in a treated apple tree baited with the pheromone and synergist in just six days. And so these are piles of stink bugs. We also know that it's fairly spatially precise. 90 percent of the bugs that are killed are from that baited tree. We have a spillover of about three meters, which is the plume reach. And so essentially you're getting most of the bugs in a single baited tree that you treat with an insecticide. And the reason that works is because there's a long retention time. Using our um, harmonic radar system, we know that they will remain in a baited apple tree for greater than 24 hours. So it can work. So we did a commercial uh, track and kill setup with my colleagues in New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia, where we um, compared a track and kill and a grower standard program. In this case, a track and kill trees were spaced every 50 meters around the border of an orchard, and they were baited with the combo of pheromone and MDT. And this was 
and these were treated weekly with an insecticide as a killing agent, and this was compared with the grower standard program. And then blocks were monitored with our baited pyramid traps, and if the threshold was hit, the block was treated. So this was uh, done over several seasons, and what we found was it actually worked really well. This is the percent damage at harvest in the perimeter of the orchards and the interior in the attract and kill block versus the grower standard. And in 2015, which was a lower population, relative population density year versus 2016, in every case, the attract and kill had lower, um, often significantly lower injury than the grower standard. So, and sprays overall were reduced by greater than 70%. So it was working well, but growers did not like having to treat these trees on a weekly basis. So we wanted to transition to something that was a lot simpler, put it up and forget about it, kind of like mating disruption. And so we started working with these long lasting insecticide treated nets as a killing agent where this could be used in combination to, um, to take out BMSB. But the question is where should the nets be positioned relative to the orchard to maximize their killing effects against BMSB? And so this is the, some recent work that we're still pawing through all the data. I expect we'll submit something this fall. But essentially, the big takeaway is that if you remove this um, net and decouple it from the attractive stimuli, the host plant and the pheromone, it doesn't work as well because the bugs aren't retained as well. Um, you need all three items together. And so when we put this net directly on a tree, it works really well, or if it's just next to, and this is a compromise, this next to, because you can't, regulatorily speaking, you can't, this is not labeled for uh, being placed on an apple tree. So this, this has worked well, and we see injury less than or equivalent to a, a, a conventional grower program. So we're, we're happy with this work so far, but there's a problem. And the problem is that these nets are becoming, a lot of the companies don't see a big market for them in ag. And so we're not sure about the future of this work at this point. And certainly our monitoring trap is a big piece of this. And having these monitoring traps we and, and our attract and kill and grower standard sites at the center of our blocks, that's what we've been doing, um, has worked well to make sure that the system is not being overwhelmed. Um, but the last piece I wanna just talk about briefly is um, our biocontrol and area-wide work. You know, certainly biocontrol is the best long-term solution for any of these invasive species as they can operate across the landscape. Now, we do have a lot of native species that have been identified by my lab, as well as many of my colleagues that affect different life stages, but they have not adequately regulated BMSB, BMSB populations. So there has been this effort to look at potential, um, a potential classical biological control program with some of these ciliated wasps, the Trisulca species. And one in particular, Japonicus, has been kind of has been go going through um, post specificity screening and quarantine, but <laughs> like many things, Trisulcus japonicus, just like BMSB, showed up on its own, and we now have adventive populations that was first discovered in Maryland in 2014, but it's now present in 14 states. And if you have it present in your state and your state department of ag agrees, you can actually consider redistributing this pest. Um, but the question for us has been, how can we best integrate this egg parasitoid into our management programs from BMSB? So, um, my colleague and former postdoc Dalton Ludwig uh, did some work asking that question where if we use reduced risk IPM tactics such as threshold based sprays, attract and kill, or even border sprays that have been led by Ann Nielsen at Rutgers, we have found that not surprisingly, we increased the refugia for uh, Trisulcus japonicus and because of that, we can increase the adult T. japonica survivorship in and around these orchards and their progenies emergence. And that's what we want. We want something that can operate and reduce the populations at a landscape level, but have these IPM tactics that we can incorporate into the system to allow everything to work together as well as it can so that we can manage this pest. 
And this really led to the work that we're doing most recently, which is our Mid-Atlantic Area-Wide Project. And area-wide projects are essentially applicable to highly mobile polyphagous pests that occur in patchy densities across diverse landscape elements. And so it is really based on landscape level management as opposed to field to field management, which we often think of. And so my colleague, Ann Nielsen in New Jersey at Rutgers, Greg Krawcheck at Penn State, Chris Berg at Virginia Tech and our lab had four area-wide sites. We were where we were trying to integrate these biorational or IPM tactics into specialty and grow crops for BMSB, advanced um, strategies for enhanced biocontrol, and really see if we can have an impact on these populations across the landscape. And so we've been doing this project since 2017. And what we have for this is a management site and a companion site. The management site, they're about one kilometer square. And what we did was to map the landscape elements and match them to our companion site and then do background BMSB monitoring. We've done this for two years. And then we started incorporating advanced IPM tactics and we've been redistributing T. japonicus in these hot spots that we've identified based on our background monitoring. This is the management or area-wide site. In the control or companion site, we are not doing these releases and we are not promoting the adoption of these advanced IPM tactics. And so we're coming into our fifth year now to see if we have an impact in these areas with this project. And so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to tell that story you know, in the next year or so, but it is really interesting and it's been a really illuminating project. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. Um, but the bottom line is we still have to remain vigilant. Even after 10 years, we still have damaging populations in the Mid-Atlantic. We still are using and refining our IPM tactics in apples and other crops, including thresholds for border sprays, for example. We're still evaluating area-wide management um, as an approach to pop reduce populations across the landscape. And we wanna promote grower adoption of these tactics and really reduce what um, Christian Krupke and I talked about just before this, the legacy effects of an invasion from BMSB. So I'd like to thank our BMSB SCRI team, as well as all of my uh, lab members over the years that have worked on this project, including my undergrads and our funding sources. And this is our socially distanced lab picture from 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was, wow, an awesome seminar. Um, so much work and so much that, wow, um, your group and others have contributed to the management of this insect. Um, I remember when they first appeared, everybody was freaked out, you know, um, and people still are because it's yeah. a big problem, but um, wow. So really appreciate your seminar. It looks like we do have a few questions and I'm just going to read them to you from the chat. Um, looks like the first one is from, let me scroll up here. Um, from one of our graduate students, Leslie, and she asks, um, how do you decide um, in your bioassays which uh, stink bugs are the distinction between moribund and dead? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, what we do is we, we have to um, kind of prod them a little bit to see if there is a, at least, you know, you'll, st they'll still have, they have, <laughs> <laughs> they they still have a, they might move a leg a little bit they're still they're not there's still a little bit of I mean I, I should read the description to you from if you look in our paper there's a much better description than I'm going to articulate right now but we did have a, a specific definition that we used between more abundant dead for alive they had to be upright and they had to be foraging around the cup more abundant they were essentially incapacitated they weren't dead but they weren't really moving at all um, they were essentially on their backs just slowly kicking <laughs> Barely treading water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, our next question is from Emily Justice, and she asks, I'm also a graduate student in our department, did you consider a protein mark and recapture strategy for tracking BMSB movement through the landscape? Yes, and we have worked, my, my former postdoc, Kevin Rice, who's at University of Missouri, did a lot of that work when he was a postdoc at Penn State and with me. And so that does work too. And he was able to show this, 
border driven effect of VMSP from woodlots into orchards and other cropping systems. So absolutely, it's another very good, and Ann Nielsen has used it as well in some of her work. So it's a very good strategy as well. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I wonder, is there a difference in price? Like, I guess in terms of... It's so, you know, with, um, with uh, the, um, and obviously um, Dr. Hagler from USDA ARS was, you know, really pioneered that work. And so with mark release recapture, you're tracking a cohort. With something like harmonic radar, you're tracking the individual over time. So you can get different kinds of data with these approaches. So, you know, or with the protein dot or with the fluorescent dust, it's the same kind of thing. You're, you, you get some recapture, but you don't know where they are at each right. moment. So, oh, okay. and we do have a project going on right now where we're using drones to autonomously detect um, marked BMSB with the protein, I mean, sorry, with the fluorescent dust. So that's sort of the next step where we're trying to marry some of these okay. together. Well, that's yeah. really interesting. I didn't think about the difference between tracking individuals versus groups. Yeah. Really critical one, especially yeah. since these insects aggregate. Yeah. Um, okay, Emily says thanks. Um, and we also have a question from Matt Dittman, um, also a graduate student in our department. Um, he says, I know that bed bug dogs sometimes have issues with false positive rates. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the false positive rate was for these BMSB detecting dogs? Yeah, so in fact, there was a rule that we had that they had to have, they had to have above, I believe it was 92% efficacy, no false positive before they would move on to a more complicated environment. So we went from that, what I showed you, which was the storage area. Then we went to where we were concealing bugs under pieces of bark in an orchard where we knew they weren't overwintering because there is no overwintering space. And then from there, we did the same kind of thing through these narrow transects in the woodlots. And then we went full on wild landscape on the Appalachian Trail. And it they were amazing. They were amazing. Wow. But yeah, but there is. And especially, you know, if you hear about the, the big project with um, African, those giant African snails, like some of the slugs and things like that. But with BMSB, they've been really, really just highly accurate and New Zealand has worked with the US to um, train their own cohort of detector dogs for their uh, ports because it's so accurate. Yeah. That's awesome. And they're, I think you said 20 times faster, which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not surprising. We couldn't keep up. And that's the issue because this is the issue. You have to confirm with the detector dog. So that reinforces that learning and it might take us like an hour to find a single bug that they've detected. I'm like, oh man, you know, it's just, that's the, that's the big issue. And so we need kind of a way to still do that work, but reinforce it. Like we need to know that they're right, but also um, be able to do it. Like we can't detect them as quickly as they can. That's the problem. We can't find them. Right. Okay. Um, looks like we have I think one more question. I have a question too, but in the interest of time, I may save it mm -hmm. and ask you when we visit mm -hmm. later. Um, it's from Cliff Sadoff, um, mm -hmm. and he's asking, do you think your integrated approach can serve as a model for other invasives? Um, I'm wondering if maybe he's thinking of invasives we've just detected in Indiana, like spotted lanternfly. Dun, uh, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so as addition, in addition to that question, if so, um, are there any limitations? So, yeah. So, um, we just published a paper last year that I had uh, Dalton worked with me on, and it really is about just doing that, like a model for how to address an invasive species crisis. We put it in the Journal of IPM. Mm -hmm. And I do think it, it it is a good model because one of the things that we did right from the beginning was to identify the short, medium, and long-term priorities. We identified the team. And my take on it as leading the project, you know, when it first got going was you really need to be able to work together. Otherwise it's, you know, there's just so much and everybody has strengths and matching their strengths to the priorities was critical, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, I've been fortunate to work with all of these people across the country on this project. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no other questions, and it sounds like, well, sounds like I'm looking at the chat, it's quieted down. 
um, I'll thank you again on behalf of the department and everyone sure. who's watching, even though you can't see, can't see their faces. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And yeah, just looking forward to, to seeing yeah. more and really appreciate you being willing to give the seminar virtually to our department. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the invitation. I enjoyed it a lot. So, and I guess I'll see people at 12. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. I'll go okay. find something to eat and I'll see you guys at 12. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. Have a great semester.